Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Good evening, everyone. Avant toute chose, nous souhaiterions reconnaître que nous sommes présentement situés sur les territoires ancestraux non cédés de la nation Algonquin. Before anything else, we would like to acknowledge that our event is taking place on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin nation. My name is Florian Martin Barreto. I am an assistant professor of law and technology at the Faculty of Law, Common Law Section, and the director of the Center for Law, Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir ce soir en si grand nombre au sein de la Faculté de droit de l'Université d'Ottawa pour cette douzième conférence commémorative d'Idri G. Martin sur la vie privée. I would like to especially welcome the family of the late Didri G. Martin and the donors of the Didri G. Martin Memorial Fund that support that annual lecture on privacy. And of course, I am delighted to welcome tonight the Information Commissioner of the United Kingdom, Elizabeth Denham, uh, who kindly accepted to be this year's distinguished lecturer. Avant de céder la parole à notre conférencière, Stephen Lingard dira quelques mots au sujet de Deidre Jim Martin et du fond. Puis mon collègue Ian Kerr aura le plaisir et le privilège de prendre la parole pour vous présenter notre conférencière. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Florian. Bon, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Je suis Stephen Lingard, le directeur principal du service juridique et chef de la protection des renseignements personnels du Bureau d'assurance du Canada. My name is Stephen Lingard. I'm director of legal services and chief privacy officer at Insurance Bureau of Canada. I'm privileged to make some comments about Deirdre Martin, whose memory is being honored by this lecture. Uh, Florian referred to some members of Deirdre's family. They are here today. I'd like to introduce uh, Connor White, who's Deirdre's eldest son, and Jan Barnaby, who's a close family friend. Members of Deirdre's family have attended all of the previous lectures since the series started in 2008. Unfortunately, my IBC colleagues, Randy Bundes and Mario Fiorino, are unable to attend today's lecture. I'd like to say a few words about Deirdre Martin so that you, you will understand how this lecture came to be. After working in private practice and also as in-house counsel for several years, Deirdre joined IBC's legal services in 1998, where she worked until her passing in 2006. Deirdre and I worked together on a wide variety of issues related to the then new federal private sector privacy law, BPEDA, and the then new provincial privacy laws in Alberta and BC. And Liz Denham is familiar with those laws. Time passes quickly, and it's hard to think back to when these privacy laws weren't in effect. Deirdre felt very strongly about protecting the privacy rights of insurance consumers. She built upon her knowledge of the property and casualty insurance industry and became an authority on the practical and business issues involved in the application of privacy laws to our industry and insurance consumers. She was well aware that things keep on changing and that what was established law or best practices one day would likely change and would need to be reconsidered and updated. She also knew the value of hearing from others who have different views and new approaches. As we've seen over the years, the scope of privacy protection and its implementation continue to evolve. Deirdre was a very proud graduate of the University of Ottawa Law School, which made your law school an obvious choice at which we could establish a privacy lecture in Deirdre's name. The first lecture was in 2008, and here we are at the 12th lecture. These lectures are intended to give you, the University of Ottawa law students, an opportunity to hear from leading privacy speakers on new and emerging issues and challenges. We hope that today's lecture may inspire you to follow Deirdre's example and to become knowledgeable and effective proponents of privacy rights and protection in your legal and business careers. In previous years, we've been privileged to hear from a number of excellent speakers, too many to mention by name. And this year, the 12th lecture, 
we are privileged to hear from Elizabeth Denham, who is the UK Information Commissioner. I'd like to thank the University of Ottawa Common Law Faculty and the Centre for Law, Technology and Society for their work in organizing these lectures, including the selection of world-class speakers. And finally, I would like to thank everyone in the audience for coming to today's lecture. And I'll now turn over the podium to Professor Ian Kerr, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I have the extremely enviable task of introducing the Information Commissioner of the UK, Elizabeth Denham, or as she is sometimes known, Lizzie. <laughs> Um, so when we were talking about who we would invite, and it's been 12 years of extremely impressive speakers, one after the next, and each year we have that amped up desire to sort of top what we've done in the past, it was unanimous and obvious that we wanted to have Elizabeth Denham uh, come and address us. And I remember the discussion very well that I had with my colleague Florian, and he said, do you think there's any chance we could get her to come? And I'm like, totally, she loves Canada. <laughs> and, she, and so anyways, I did what any privacy professional did who wanted to have a communication with her where I didn't want other people to buddy, and I Facebooked her. That's <laughs> where all privacy professionals get their privacy. Um, and so Florian was kind of a little bit concerned about my methodology, um, but uh, I, I asked her in any event, um, she very quickly replied uh, that she was excited about the invitation, but you know, she, she works in an office of about 800 people and there's protocols and whatnot, and we'd probably have to go through the protocols. Um, I think I was traveling for a couple of days, and by the time I was to get back uh, and get on top of those protocols, uh, sure enough, we had a, already a communication from her office that she'd accepted our invitation. So uh, we're so excited and glad to have you here. If I can just make a couple of autobiographical uh, remarks, um, I remember the second time that we met. That's when we really got to know each other, At Elizabeth. At breakfast? No. Uh, th this, <laughs> um, th this was... <laughs> It's all on Facebook. Um, <laughs> this is, this is uh, uh, at Commissioner Luca Delis's home at an event that was going on, a privacy event in, in British Columbia, where I had been invited as the speaker. At the time, if I recall correctly, uh, Elizabeth was working as sort of one of the senior policy people in Frank Work's uh, shop, uh, the, 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 the then Commissioner of the Privacy of Alberta. Privacy Commissioner of Alberta. And so all of the commissioners from across Canada were at this dinner. It was just the commissioners and me as the invited guest. And of course, my luggage, I had checked my luggage for some stupid reason, and my luggage was lost. And so they're all suited up, and I was in shorts and a t-shirt. And so what I'm about to describe to you very briefly is Elizabeth Denham's uh, meteoric rise, um, whereas I feel that I still stand here before you today waiting for my suitcase to arrive. Uh, in any event, uh, Liz at the time went from Frank Work's office to then seconding uh, to the office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada's office, where she was just fit in so beautifully, and I know she has many colleagues in the room who've, who've come from near and far to see her tonight, um, and um, was really doing some interesting work, including the sort of famous Facebook complaint at the time, which was, of course, the tie into the University of Ottawa, because it was our students at CIPIC that brought that complaint that, that Commissioner Danham was uh, then dealing with. And from that point in time, from being the assistant uh, commissioner uh, at the federal office, she then went on to become the BC commissioner, and then not that long after, I uh, became, of course, in her current uh, position. We had the opportunity to, to spend some time together again at the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. It's a mouthful. I got it right, I think. Um, in Marrakesh. Uh, and I think that was like a couple of months after you took the job uh, as the UK commissioner. And I'll say now, two years later, she's the head of, of the international conference as well. Um, so we're so lucky to ha and so privileged to have such a privacy expert. Uh, I was going to say um, that when we met and had our first discussion, the thing that I remembered about it 
was you told me how your foray into this field was as an archivist. And it clicked immediately to me, that was obvious, that somebody who understands collections understands privacy, and someone understands about the curation and the architecture of collections has a real strong footing for understanding privacy. And we've just seen Liz do amazing things ever since. So without further ado, um, I give the floor to Elizabeth Denham. I hope the first question you'll answer during the question period is um, when and whether, whether and when you'll be returning to Canada. And it's just so great to have you here. Thank you, Ian. Bon bonsoir à tous. Um, now that I'm in the UK, I don't often bring greetings en français. I need to bring greetings in Welsh. And so that's, um, that's a whole other story uh, for me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight. And it is a bit of, I see Amanda in the background there, it's a bit of old home week for me um, in this room tonight and also to have an opportunity to tell you some of the stories from the United Kingdom. I'll tell you one thing is, as I was being mic'd up to get ready for this talk, um, the technician said to me, well, where's the British lady that I'm supposed to be miking up? You must be her assistant. <laughs> So I had to explain to him that, that I'm not a British lady, but I am the, the UK Information Commissioner. But um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here tonight to deliver this, this lecture to the University of Ottawa and also to Stephen and the, the IBC. I'm, I'm really humbled, though, to be in this room. This is an academic lecture. I am not an academic. But I look around the room and there's internationally renowned privacy law scholars that are going to be beating down my neck and listening to everything I say. So I see Teresa Scazza is here, um, Michael Geist. Uh, we had a nice chat in a podcast earlier, of course. Ian Kerr, my good buddy, and I'll tell you the story about the breakfast later and the Q's and A's if you want to ask me about that. Um, and Jane Bailey, you know, I'm just... Delighted to be here. Again, I'm not a scholar, I'm not an academic, but I will bring to you the stories on the ground as a regulator of information rights. And when I listen to someone like Ian Kerr telling the story of all the places that he's met me and, and where I've been, it kind of sounds like I can't keep a job <laughs> as I jump around. Um, so again, it's fantastic to see students in the room. And um, it takes me back to my studies at the University of British Columbia, where I studied archival and information science. And I became first really passionate about information rights, the architecture and the curation of collection, but also mediating access between depositors of collections and researchers. And when I'm wearing my freedom of information hat, because I'm the FOI commissioner as well as the data protection commissioner, then that really takes me back. So I'm passionate about information rights. And tonight, I want to talk to you about a topic that I hope can arouse passion in us all. Are we doing enough to protect democracy in the digital age? I want to talk to you about how an investigation by my office in the UK found cause for us to question whether the use of big data in political campaigns is disrupting democracy. And I want to talk to you about how the investigation that we have undertaken in the UK revealed issues that are relevant across the world. And finally, I want to talk about where all this is headed, big data politics, and the academic arguments that suggest that we, as privacy professionals and as regulators, 
are on the front line of a battle to protect the future of democracy. So these are big topics. These are big issues and ones that I'm honored to be here to talk to you about tonight. The Deirdre G. Martin Memorial Speech is an event that I've long admired. And I did actually work around the protocol in order to accept the invitation from Florian. So my colleague from the UK will, will actually admit that I have done that from time to time. But the, this memorial speech is an event that I've attended before. It's an event that I've long admired. And if you look back over the history of some of the people who've accepted this invitation in the past, really endorses this event as a biography of the past decade and a bit of information rights. I know how good these lectures are because I've sat in the seats, in these seats before. In 2009, I remember being here to listen to Professor Daniel Solov of George Washington University Law School, and he was giving his view about how our understanding of privacy has evolved over time. And I know that a lot of you here tonight were also in, that, in this room in 2009. I see my, my good friend Ann Goldsmith, Barb Bucknell, Heather Black, you were all here at that time. So, 10 years later, here we are again. Not that things haven't changed in 10 years. <laughs> so there I am, I've actually switched my hiking pole for a glass of wine. So there's my evolution in the past 10 years. So yes, 10 years ago, I was Assistant Privacy Commissioner of Canada and I was privileged to work with Jennifer Stoddard, who was the then commissioner, during part of her tenure. But by 2009, I was overseeing private sector privacy across Canada. Um, I had issued a report, 113 page report, following a comprehensive investigation into the inner workings of Facebook and Facebook's compliance with PIPEDA. And as Ian said, that investigation was prompted by concerns that were raised by CIPIC, which is, of course, a leading research clinic here at the university. And I'm wondering if um, Tamir Israel is in, the, is in the audience tonight. He's here. He's way at the back. Hi, Tamir. Yeah. <laughs> So you well recall this case, and we had lots of deep discussions about this case. But I mean, it was a beautiful complaint. It was very well constructed. It was very complicated. And some of my colleagues, some of whom are here tonight, were sort of cursing the detail in that complaint. But in response, in response to that complaint, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner really had the opportunity to examine the inner workings of Facebook. And that investigation was the first investigation that any data protection authority undertook of a social media platform. So as again, I won't go into the detail of the 113 page report. I think CIPIC was mostly satisfied with the response. And of course, there was a negotiated resolution, the subject of which I think is still before the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada today, as they examine Facebook in light of the Cambridge Analytica issue. Anyway, I'm not going through the details of the investigation, but a couple of the quotes from that investigation stand out. That 2009 report really laid bare the business model of Facebook, and it set out detailed findings that aspects of the social media platform's model did not comply with PIPEDA. Given the uncertain, given the centrality of targeted advertising to Facebook's business model, individuals were not given sufficient information 
about how their personal data was being used to allow organizations to target them with ads. And we found that third-party application developers had, guess what, too much access to personal information with too little consent. So 10 years later, plus ça change. Because this year, in 2019, I find myself mostly talking about a report that the UK's Information Commissioner's Office had carried out into Facebook. An investigation that found that users aren't being given enough information about how their personal information is used to allow organizations to target them with ads and messages on Facebook. An investigation that found that third-party application developers had too much access to personal information with too little consent. An investigation that again laid bare the business model of Facebook and set out detailed findings that aspects of that model do not comply with the law. Sound familiar? I'm looking at Kate and she's smiling. But what has changed, what has changed in the last decade is where the crosshairs of this data-fueled micro-targeting are trained. Because our investigation in the UK found that the behavioral advertising tools that are used to sell us trainers and cars and holidays have now been transposed into the political realm. In the UK, we found that the behind the scenes data processing techniques, data matching, custom audiences, lookalike audiences, are being used across an ecosystem of political parties, of campaigns, data brokers, data companies, and analytic companies. We found an app using personal data from Facebook users to develop personality and psychometric profiles, which then inferred political views that a person might hold. We found private companies showing a complete disregard for people's privacy. We found that they were trying to influence elections and campaigns by taking these models and combining them with ever more personal data to micro-target voters. We found political parties who prioritized their campaigns and their efforts over complying with UK data protection laws. And we found a social media company that showed a concerning disregard to what was happening on its platform, under its watch, affecting millions of people worldwide. The more this investigation progressed, the more I was brought back to a comment by Marshall McLuhan. We shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. So we know that Social media is used by millions of people every day across the globe to keep in touch with friends and family or messages to accept invitations to speak at the University of Ottawa. But social, rapid social and technological developments in the use of big data have left us with limited knowledge and limited transparency around the techniques that were initially used to target, to market commercial products, and now to influence political actions. So this investigation revealed the extent to which profiling and personalization is used to surreptitiously nudge and target us in political campaigns. In Britain, in the US, and in other jurisdictions. 
And at a time when very narrow margins determine political outcomes, these tools risk shaping democracy in very uncomfortable ways. I want to talk briefly about three key aspects of our findings which demonstrate the worldwide impact of the investigation and I think touch on the work of a lot of people that are sitting in this room. And for each of these key aspects, I want to offer an area where I believe that progress is being made to protect the integrity of our democratic processes. So, the question I get asked all of the time is, are big social media firms beyond the law? The short answer is no. In the UK, we were able to respond to what we found in our investigation by imposing sanctions and fines and criminal prosecutions. We showed that the existing law on data protection applied as much online as it did offline. And these powers include issuing a then maximum 500,000 pound fine to Facebook for lack of transparency, fairness, and security on the platform. The UK law has been recently updated by the EU's General Data Protection Regulation in 2018. And if Facebook took the same actions today, the fine would be significantly, significantly higher. As Information Commissioner, I now have the power to compel organizations to provide information. We can audit algorithms, internal processes, we can issue stop processing orders, and we can level, levy fines to up to 4% of global turnover. Uniquely, I also have prosecuting powers. So these are modern tools to investigate digital campaigns. But where we need to see progress is in greater consistency internationally. The issues that I'm highlighting tonight will affect every liberal democracy. They all need to be able to respond with modern electoral and modern privacy laws. Significantly, the regulatory powers my office has today in the UK are much weightier than those that were available 10 years ago in Ottawa. We were then limited to making recommendations, the bully pulpit, and moral persuasion. Commissioner Danielle Therrien and the Ethic Committee of the Canadian Parliament are advocating for stronger powers and extending the federal law to cover political parties in Canada. And that's a position that I supported when I gave evidence before Ethi last year. But let's not limit our discussion to Facebook here. At the core of the issues that I'm talking about tonight is the underlying principle of companies taking people's personal data and turning it into a profit. Shoshana Zuboff's recently published book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, has received a lot of media attention. She sets out her view that big companies are monetizing data-driven insights in unprecedented ways, to an extent that risks undermining the very principles of capitalism. We may be some way from that happening, but the law really needs to be updated to prevent that direction of travel. Regulators should not and must not be shy about examining the complex digital products and services that rely on data, as so many of them do. And if what we find is beyond our remit, 
as we found in the UK in our investigation, then we need to have the courage to call for legislators to change the law. Which brings me to the politicians themselves where we found that our powers didn't reach as far as our concerns. And society already accepts that the stakes are too high to simply trust politicians to follow the rules around elections. That's why we have electoral regulators. But in the UK, we found that the law in this area has not kept pace with developments in technology, micro-targeting techniques used by political parties and used by campaigns exposed gaps in the regulatory landscape that occurred due to the move offline to online political campaigns. One step that my office took to, was to table a policy report to accompany our Cambridge Analytica Facebook investigation. And that report, entitled Democracy Disrupted, includes a series of recommendations for the UK government to prevent further voter manipulation, both by political parties, foreign actors, and social media platforms. Our report was written to protect the future. And one key recommendation is that the government should legislate to issue a statutory code of practice for the use of personal data in political campaigns. And this code, which we're working on, would include practical examples of what good looks like in privacy compliant campaigning and help parties avoid bad practices. So that's the UK perspective, but I suspect that the situation is much more challenging in Canada. Commissioner Michael McAvoy's recent report called Full Disclosure, Political Parties, Campaign Data and Voter Consent highlighted that British Columbia is the only jurisdiction in Canada that covers, where privacy law covers political parties. And even there, he finds that his limited powers really restrict his ability to pull back the curtain on how parties are using data. So we've made progress in the UK with a growing number of voices that are supporting our call to update electoral law, including the Electoral Commission itself. But it, it seems clear to me that in jurisdictions where analog electoral laws lag behind our digital times, there are disruptive influences out there that are going to look to take advantage. And those disruptive influencers won't always reside within our borders. Our investigation began by looking at a British-based company, Cambridge Analytica, and another company, Aggregate IQ, based in Victoria, British Columbia, working and looking to influence voters in the UK, in the US, and beyond. I think we all know that the digital world doesn't make distinctions based on international boundaries. And our investigation was international, just like the reaches, the reach of the approaches to targeting voters that I talked about earlier. Irish transparency advocates analyzed the digital ads that a sample of 600 voters saw in the run-up to Ireland's 2018 referendum on legalizing abortion. And they found 317 different groups behind the online ads. One in 20 was paid for by groups registered outside of Ireland 
including in Canada and the US. And our forensic analysis of the Cambridge Analytica servers revealed that the company was planning to move out of the UK to what it saw as an unregulated jurisdiction in response to our investigation. So they were just going to take their services elsewhere. So in that context, it isn't enough for regulators and lawmakers to limit their views to issues within their traditional or their national jurisdictions. This is really a challenge affecting all liberal democracies. And that's why a central part of my role and that of other data protection commissioners around the globe is working more closely together. More cooperation, more collaboration. An international grand committee of parliamentarians has convened to look at this issue, showing that progress is being made. Parliamentarians from nine jurisdictions, representing half a billion people, including Canada and Ireland, Argentina, Singapore, came together in Westminster to question Facebook on data privacy, safety, and security. And I think that's a clear acknowledgement from those involved that electoral interference and big data politics needs a joined up international approach. And the Grand Committee's work continues and it plans to convene in Ottawa in May of this year. We need that world view. From Washington to Wellington, I'm speaking with global privacy, the global privacy community, including chairing the International Conference, a group that many of you have links to. And I mention all of this not to boast about my increasingly well-worn out navy blue passport, but really to demonstrate how globalized data protection has become. And because I believe the solution needs a global response that goes even further. What is needed is global enforcement of data protection. And we can hit the ground running here. Cooperation is already quite good between specific authorities. The investigative teams in my office work closely with the Canadian Federal and British Columbia offices in our investigation into AIQ and Facebook this year, despite some legal barriers. But we need more consistency and formal enforcement arrangements, something that I'll be focusing on during my tenure as conference chair. In the EU, the GDPR provides a formal process for cross-border breaches of the law to be handled collectively. Data protection authorities in the EU sit together to review the evidence collected by one or by more of us before deciding on a single regulatory response. That's the theory anyway. But this ensures that no bad actor can take advantage of what we might call regulator shopping by basing themselves in what they perceive as a soft touch jurisdiction. But this only works effectively because the, in the EU, we share the same privacy law. Ultimately, I believe that what's needed is an international instrument setting out universal data protection standards fit for the digital age. And I may be a dreamer, I know this is many years in the making, but in the short to medium term, we can focus on making our laws interoperable. And we can do incremental work on the privacy threats of shared concern. And I think the greatest shared concern in recent years is the misuse 
of data in the context of politics. This is the best opportunity to facilitate joined up thinking on privacy threats to all of our citizens. And the more joined up our thinking is, the less real estate that we leave open to those that hide behind borders to do their misdeeds. If we can get more countries talking about the same risks at the same time, the odds are that we're going to be able to borrow and share best practice. This isn't easy work, but as professionals in this space, it's increasingly clear that our task is to protect the fundamental aspects of democracy, freedom of expression, privacy, free and fair elections. So that might sound like a very grand idea and a grand claim, but there's a growing number of voices, of academic voices, and thinking that what we're talking about today is at the front line of protecting future democracy. How many of you were here for last year's lecture? A few. Arias Rewaldman talked about the dynamics of social spaces, whether they be online or in person. And he made the point that the safety of those spaces depends on careful balances of disclosure and of trust, but buttressed by the law. His research suggests that if people's concerns around how and where their information is being disclosed is not underpinned by law, then safe spaces risk becoming centers of hate and harassment where only the powerful can be heard. And I think all of us recognize that description as applying to the most unpleasant corners of the internet. Jamie Bartlett takes this idea further in his book, The People Versus Tech, which explains his view that the internet is killing democracy. He has frequent references to the ICO's investigation of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. But Bartlett cautions that while the connectivity of social media brings people together and allows anyone to find a community of like-minded people, this also brings a tribalism that has the effect of magnifying the small differences between us. And I think, again, anyone who has observed political discussions on a platform like Twitter knows this feeling all too well. This isn't to lay all the blame at the door of digital. Tribal politics, polarization, and populism come knocking from a number of roots. But Bartlett does see a way in which social media packages information as being the driving factor as they are led by financial incentives to offer us content ever more tailored to our tribe. Think about filter bubbles here. His ultimate concern, that warring online tribes are a precursor to totalitarianism and the end of democracy, a view that's echoed by Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Harari goes on to explain how limited our expertise is in regulating in this area. We have hundreds of years of experience in regulating the ownership of land. And we have a couple of hundred experience, years of experience in regulating the ownership of industry. But when it comes to regulating the ownership of data, an inherently more difficult task, we have a lot of questions. It's not an impossible task. 
Harari acknowledges the potential for technical solutions. And Bartlett proposes education programs and he proposes updated laws. At an event earlier this month in Brussels, I was a group, I met with a group of data protection regulators, electoral regulators, media regulators, parliamentarians, and tech industry reps who came together to find practical solutions to online manipulation in the European elections. The last two years has been a wake-up call. More citizens, although not enough, have become aware, more aware of their digital surroundings. Policymakers, journalists, whistleblowers, academics, and regulators are awake to the threat to our democratic processes. And I think we're no longer naively applauding online services and platforms as nothing but positive tools for innovation and freedom of expression. But we also have to make sure that in our debate and in our discussions that we don't vilify the platforms for wrecking havoc on our fundamental rights. Neither of those views represents reality. And so that last point is really important. The fact that political parties and campaigns all over the world have invested heavily in digital campaigning in recent years does show its potential to engage more voters, to engage especially young voters online, and engage those voters that don't go out into the public square. So this engagement with voters is vital to the democratic process. Nor is this debate a crusade against Silicon Valley. That's not gonna work. In January, Facebook reported its profits. And more than two billion people every day use one of Facebook's services. So privacy professionals, privacy law scholars, can't be cast as Canute holding back the tide. Instead, democracy needs to look at the risks and find a creative response so that changes to how elections and campaigns are fought happen alongside changes that preserve the integrity of the election itself. The point here is that voters have to feel that they are in control of the outcome. So this is not all about social media companies. Political parties are driving the demand and they need to be transparent and they need to be fair and there will be some red lines. That's why it's so hard for us to be drafting this code. Data companies have to comply with the law. And for goodness sakes, micro-targeting for a clothing preference and micro-targeting for political persuasion must never be treated as one and the same line of business. Everybody here looks really serious. <laughs> but I sometimes find myself in rooms like this one talking about the dangers and the risks of information sharing through social media. And I look around the room, and what are people doing? They're nodding, they're taking notes on their smartphones, on their laptops, on Facebook. And, and I do realize what a challenge this is. And the question is, we can get to this in the Q&A, what are the solutions? What are the answers? And as the privacy law expert and experts in this room, 
often it's our job to apply the brake. To be presented with an exciting, innovative idea, program, service, and say, hey, that looks really great, but before you go any further, have you thought about the law? Are you going to explain to people how their personal data is being used? Do you think you're going to take them with you in this idea? And often, a little consideration and a little constraint can be a beautiful thing. And I think in that context, we can learn a lot from Deirdre, from Deirdre Martin. I first came across Deirdre when she was working at the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and our paths crossed several times over the years. And as anyone in this room who knew Deirdre would agree, she was unfailingly positive, friendly, but unwilling to be pushed around. And that last one is the key. The insurance industry loves data. Isn't that right, Stephen? It likes being able to make its products more efficient. It likes being able to risk assess accurately. But that means using people's data and not always in ways that people expect or that people would accept. Deirdre's job was often to apply the brake. It was hers to say, hey, that looks great, but have you thought about the law? Are you going to be able to explain to people what you're doing with their data? And you know what? She had that <coughs> unflinching, tactful determination fueled by a knowledge that what she was doing was right. And I think, I think that's the note that I want to end on tonight. And I'm very grateful for you to host me tonight, to the university, to the IBC, to the support from the Canadian Bar Association, um, and continuing to support this event that I think Deirdre would have been enormously proud of. And also to all of you for your attention and interest in being here on this very cold night. But what we do, what we all do in this room and the area of society that we choose to focus on requires that we apply the brake at times. And I think in the face of disinformation, voter manipulation, data misuse, and electoral interference, we need to grapple with what I believe to be the greatest societal internet harm. And I think we'll all need the determination that Deirdre showed, fueled by knowing that what we're doing is right. It's important, and it might just be crucial to protecting our future democracy. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Commissioner Denham. So we have um, a few minutes for a Q&A uh, session. Uh, I will ask you to um, please go to the mics. So there is uh, two mics. And um, so, yeah, if you have, like, any question uh, you want to ask to the Commissioner. Can I wander around? Yeah, yeah please, mm -hmm. you can. So... We will be the first one to be, yeah. Please, sir. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that fascinating and somewhat nerve-wracking um, talk about data and democracy. I suppose the natural question at the end of that would be, so what are the regulatory solutions that you talked about, like creative responses, uh, the dangers of, of micro-advertising for political campaigns that we've sort of, that you referenced and that we've seen through Cambridge Analytica? 
Um, would focusing on exactly how that data can be used in a political context be practical? Should be focusing on how the data is collected themselves or whether people um, are aware of how it's being used? Well, what would like a, a solid regulatory response around data to protect democracy look like? Thanks for that. That's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Am I mic'd up? Yeah. Um, so I think the regulatory solutions are, first of all, enforce the law that we have now. So obviously in Canada, it's, a, it's an issue if the law doesn't extend to political parties and political campaigns. But where it does, we need to enforce the laws that we have. Our push for a code of practice for the use of data in political campaigns, I think is going to clear the field and, and give some assurance to campaigns and political parties about how to get the balance right between engagement, which is really important, and misuse of personal data. So that's what our code of practice is going to do, backed with the force of law. So that's the detail that I think is really important. Is it, it's the line. <laughs> it's a line. It's hard. Where's the red lines? You know, the red line could be, I think, look-alike audiences, for example, on Facebook that those kinds of inferences, you can never get the kind of consent that is needed under the law. So I think the clarity of a code is really important. But in most jurisdictions, including across Europe, electoral commissions have analog laws that don't allow them to reach across borders to be able to report on the financing of political campaigns to identify interference. So there needs to be an update of electoral law alongside of an update to data protection law. And I think the other thing that is needed um, across all jurisdictions is joined up working between electoral commissions, data protection authorities, privacy commissioners, and cybersecurity agencies. Because these are the big threats to elections and campaigns. So in our report, Democracy Disrupted, there's a lot of detail about the regulatory response. There's a real commitment in the EU to work on, to work on this. The European Commission has a whole package of reforms. Thanks very much. Thank you. Please. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, still democracy, but in, a, in another area. So we often, uh, we're, we're exposed here to Sidewalk Toronto, which you may have heard of. Um, there's an increase in uh, smart regionalism. You know, think of the Windsor-Quebec corridor being interconnected. The Internet of Things in smart cities or the Internet of Things in precision agriculture. So my question is, what about uh, territorial integrity when large interconnected systems tied into large multinational platforms who, don't, who perhaps don't have this nation or other nations in their best interest have more knowledge and access to that knowledge than we may actually have uh, in the long term. So it's not necessarily about residency, but it's really about this territorial sovereignty over uh, a regional space where there's, you know, in, in some ways our life worlds are being colonized by device, devices and data extraction. And I'm hoping that some of you guys in the UK may have taken a look at this a little bit. Thank you. So I think, um, so again, I think the Internet of Things, which is just an absolute explosion of big data and lack of control in a territory by a data controller in a place, this is where I think our world is going to get so much more complicated. And it's why I think we need to advocate for an international instrument and global enforcement cooperation because otherwise I don't know how we can do this work. The other thing is that I think competition regulators and consumer protection regulators and data protection regulators need to get together because the digital economy can't operate anymore in silos. And I think you're gonna see a lot of changes in regulatory responses. Probably the weather's gonna be made in, in Europe on this just because mm -hmm. they're further ahead when it comes to data protection, but Canada really needs to, to catch up. And innovation and strong rights-based laws go together. And that's, that's our argument. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 
I wanted to ask if you could introduce yourself just before we asking the question and try to be the shortest as possible so we can have uh, as many questions as possible. Please. Sorry, Tracy Lorio, Carleton University. Uh, <coughs> Dwayne Winsack, Tracy's uh, colleague at Carleton University. So um, thank you very much for uh, the talk. I think it was an uh, outstanding talk and I think the idea of joined up regulation, I mean you are the embodiment of joined up regulation, uh, you know, your experience here in Canada and now at the UK, I think it's great. Um, and given this, I, this need for joined up uh, regulation, the idea that Canada is per, uh, participating in the International Grand Committee is really great. Um, and I look at uh, last week's report from your uh, colleagues at the uh, Committee on Sports, Culture, and Media. And as I read it, I see four things. Three of them I'm thinking, all right, this is great. And we get to number four, and I'm like, ah, damn. Um, does Canada want to be part of this? So the four I see is we need to have real concern with data opolis. The idea that there's you know, concentrated market power is for real. We need to deal with it accordingly. Don't have all the answers. The second is... Um, data and privacy protection uh, needs to be really brought into uh, contemporary light. Third is we need a real reboot of electoral laws for the digital environment. All there for those three. Now we get to number four and we hear Damien, Damien Collins you know, tweeting uh, last week that the UK strives to be a world leader in internet content regulation. And I'm thinking, oh shit. And, you know, so we, I, I, I tweet at Nathan and uh, Charlie, and i like, is this what you guys want too? Like, number four? Like, internet content regulation? Do we want to be a world leader in that? And what's your views on no, maybe those four and just the last one, where it fits in the hierarchy, if we should kind of, like, push it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist and let the UK be what they want to be? So I didn't quite expect that I was going to get um, the Department of Culture, Media, and Sports report quoted... <laughs> to me in Canada, so that's great. But I, <laughs> thanks for that. I, t I completely agree with the first three, and I think I was talking about that in, yeah. my, in my talk. I think that is where we're gonna get to. What's happening in the UK right now, and it was interesting, because when I met with Commissioner Terry and his, and his office yesterday to talk about internet harms, which is a really big topic in the UK right now, and because there have been um, uh, suicides and self-harm by children who have viewed videos, et cetera, online, there's a push for politicians to uh, regulate content and conduct of social media companies. So when they talk about internet harms, they're really talking about harms on social media. And there's a big discussion about how much more regulation, who should regulate, should there be a brand new internet of bad things regulator. So there's a lot of discussion about that, but I think what, what the public sees is too much information out there that's hurting kids, right? It's cyberbullying, self-harm online, and somebody needs to regulate the social media companies to take down content. We've seen the law in, in Germany, which is really about hate speech, and I think it's easier to regulate content that is already deemed to be illegal. What's hard is to regulate what is offensive but not illegal. And that's, it's going to be really challenging. There's a white paper that's coming out in the next couple of weeks. We'll see what the, the government proposes there. But I think it's going to be really challenging, as you say, freedom of expression and, and balancing these issues. That's that coupling. You know, when they say illegal content, like I'm fully there it. with them, but they keep having this phrase where they can join illegal and harmful content, and then they say it's the platforms that should assume increased liability. And so that fuzzy mashing together of illegal, which is, oh, yeah, fine, go for it, you know, yeah. and net, uh, you Hate know. Hate speech, terrorism. Yeah, go you, for I it. I mean, go for it, that's you, but the, but. Who gets to be the ministry of truth uh, okay. to say what needs to be taken down that's offensive and what's offensive to, to some is somebody else's freedom of expression. So yeah, it's the politicians have their work cut out for them. Thanks for that question. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie Perrin, Digital Discretion. Thank you for tackling this really, really hard problem. Uh, my question is kind of related to uh, Duane's question number four. Um, the, the concept 
that you're going to try to control the nudging of hearts and minds is blindingly close to uh, controlling the constitutionally protected right of, of political speech. And, you know, I can talk for hours about why we couldn't go anywhere near this when Pipita was drafted. But I'm very curious to know what the parliamentarians said when they met about their actual ability to kind of walk that line and come up with something. I understand the concept of controlling the collection of data in the face of uh, election, uh, you know, the elections bodies in the various countries. The problem is, I don't know, this will shock you to hear this, but uh, if I'm talking to my political party of choice, I'm inclined to tell them exactly what I think they ought to be doing <laughs> and everything I want. And I think that's probably a voluntary collection of data and people might consent to it. So I think this is gonna be very hard to walk. So if they said anything, please tell. So <laughs> they, they didn't come to a conclusion when the Grand Committee met in Westminster a few months ago. They're meeting again in Ottawa in May, and you know they have a, a high-level set of principles, but it's mostly about the misuse of data, non-transparent big data compilations, and you know cheating online, which is basically the whole yeah. Kogan app, and you know that you know that story, GSR. So they're focusing on that. They're focusing on the platform. I mean, so much of the political spend in digital campaigning right now is going to Facebook, but it's not all Facebook. And you know, the next campaign, it could be another social media. But, but we're arguing for the compliance with the law. And I don't think anyone, anyone can take issue with that. But when you're talking about regulating conduct and content and balancing it with political campaigning and freedom of speech, it's really hard. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> On this side. Hi, I'm Katie. Hi. I'm from here at the University of Ottawa. This, I'm too tall for this microphone. Um, so I have a question. I, I think that when we talk about this stuff about democracy, there's almost this idea that democracy is like a foregone conclusion that that we've always been democratic, which is you know palpably false because throughout history, most of the time we haven't been democratic. In fact, we've had all kinds of terrible, horrible authoritarian regimes that have been in charge. And, and some of the books that you cited today I thought was really interesting because they come from the perspective of these people who've experienced, I think some of the reviews call it tech lash, right? Like walking back from this idea that um, we're gonna have this digital monopoly and it's, or this digital world that's going to bring us a bright new future. And so I guess what I'm interested in is at the heart of all of the ideas about data protection and about privacy frameworks, there's still this idea of consent, which is fundamentally you know, a liberal understanding of an individual owning their right to their own data and being at the heart of that. But we see that sort of contrasted with this spread of authoritarian, of neoliberal ideals that is very prevalent on all of these online platforms. So how do we reconcile those ideas and how do we come at that from a regulatory perspective when consent might be kind of impoverishing the thing that we want to protect against? I don't think, so again, are you focusing on Canadian law and PIPIDA because it's much more consent-based than mm -hmm. the, other, the other legal basis for collecting and sharing information in, let's say, European law? There's also the need to balance democratic engagement with data protection. And, and that's what I think our code of practice is going to be focused on. So I think we do have the opportunity to explore these issues in the UK and in the EU because our laws aren't completely consent-based. If you do rely on consent in the, in the EU, the GDPR, then it's a very high level, it's a very high bar. And that's not necessarily what political campaigning, that's not necessarily the, the legal basis that they're going to be relying on. But you're asking me some, I'm just a, I'm a mere regulator. So I can't, I, I don't see the solution. I can't see the solution yet. But I think incrementally we can get there through some of these ideas and certainly through transparency of the provenance of ads 
So who's actually paying for ads? This is something that electoral laws have not dealt with very well. They deal with TV ads and billboards, but they're not dealing with digital campaignings and ca campaigns. And I gave you the Irish example mm -hmm. of where it's really important that social media and the funders of ads understand what's going on. Because that's the only way voters understand what's, what they're seeing in their news feed, because they don't necessarily understand that. And that's, I mean, that's what we saw in the Brexit campaign. So what we saw in the 2016 presidential campaign is a lot of misuse of data and non-transparent delivery of political messages. That's what I'm focused on. You, you're the academic. You can figure the rest out. <laughs> can I? And so we'll take a, a last question. Oh, so. good. <laughs> well, welcome home. Thank uh, you. I'm Barbara Bucknell, and I'm at ICED. Um, so I guess um, I won't be asking the question about the ICO jackets and where you got them from. Um, I'm going to just, one of my observations is um, we're talking about the, the, the transparency around advertising and the actual ads themselves, but there are state actors at play in all of this and there are bots behind some of this. And there are things that look like real people having real views. And they're even more insidious than, I think, you know, some of these other activities that have gone on. And I'm not sure it's a, totally a privacy issue. It seems like it's, you know, cybersecurity. it's cybersecurity. It, well, it's even perhaps more than that because some of this is not necessarily hacking. Um, well, this is where we're going, where you won't know what's real and what's not real. And I guess I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And of course, here in Canada, there's a large debate going on around, um, you know, a company associated with a particular country and their efforts to come in and, and uh, you know, take up the 5G space. So it it's very real, like how are we going to enforce privacy laws against that company, but how are we going to protect the integrity of our social discourse and everything else that is at the heart of our society when there are others who are quite bent on causing trouble? So thanks for that really easy question. Bob. Yeah, no problem. Um, we can't so hear you. There's always been state actors from the history of time that have interfered with elections. What's new is the misuse of data and technology. So we're talking about bots, we're talking about cybersecurity hacks, but we're also talking about at the center of the amplification of these messages is personal data. So don't forget that personal data and personalization and micro-targeting actually enhances, encourage, extends the reach of those, message, those messages. So we've got to get data protection right. We've got to get electoral law right. We need international enforcement. We need our cybersecurity agencies to work on this. And what we haven't talked about is what do we need for citizens? We need to be we need more digital and media education so that people are more questioning, can scrutinize, and can understand a bit more about the messages that they're receiving. So we need that digital education. We need stronger laws. We need international enforcement. So it's not, it's gonna take a village. But, the, but what encourages me in all of this is in the last two years, there's been much more debate, discussion, journalism, reports that have, uh, that have really identified what the problem is. And as you say, the technology is just going to be enhanced. But data, personal data, is at the heart of, of many of these harms. And so data protection authorities need to do their work. That's my point. Thank you. 
So on that word, I will invite you to thank Commissioner Denan for our lecture.